for the Americas. Good afternoon for Europe and Africa and good evening uh, for Asia. Thank you for joining us for a timely right on web discussion on access to information and safety of journalists in times of crisis. For this occasion, ahead of the 44th session of the Human Rights Council and the upcoming resolutions on safety of journalists and freedom of expression. So I'm Leslie Norton, Ambassador of Canada to the United Nations in Geneva, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before I introduce you to our distinguished panel of speakers, I'd like to say a few words about today's discussion. In times of crisis, when public authorities make decisions that affect public health, civil liberties, and people's prosperity, the public's right to access information on these decisions is vital. Under international human rights laws, governments have the responsibility to protect the right of freedom of expression, including the right to seek, receive, and impart information. Access to information is closely intertwined with the safety of journalists and media workers. Free, independent, plural, and diverse media have proven to be an indispensable ally of governments and public authorities in informing the public both during the pandemic and beyond. As such, today, more than ever, protecting journalists and media workers must not only encompass their physical, but also their legal and economic safety. Over the last few months, we saw a rise in restrictions on the media all over the world. FOI legislation was suspended or amended. Journalists were prevented to attend press conferences or denied access to information from public authorities. Our discussion today will address the challenges pertaining to the right to access to information and the growing risks to the safety of journalists in a world that struggles to recover from COVID-19 and its repercussions on societies worldwide. In order to ensure that this discussion is as interactive as possible, which can always prove challenging uh, on such platforms, we'd also like to encourage our audience to share questions and comments in the text chat that, we will, that, that will then be relayed to us by Charlotte from URG and Natasha from Diplo. We have an esteemed group of experts lined up to take this, to take this discussion forward. So with us today, we have Ms. Michelle Bachelet. Everyone knows her, of course. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. We also have Dr. Agnes Calamar, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions. Ms. Fatou Jangne Senghor, West Africa Director at Article 19, and apologies if I destroyed your name. Ms. Barbara Triomphi, as is the Executive Director of International Press Institute. Mr. David Kay, UN Special Rapporteur on Promotion and Protection of of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. And Mr. Christophe Delors, who's the Secretary General and Executive Director of Reporters Without Borders. I'm also happy to welcome today's Right On Ambassador, Robert Muller, Deputy Permanent Rep of Austria and Ambassador Monique van Dalen, Perm Rep of the Netherlands, who will be delivering the opening and closing, closing statements. Austria, the Netherlands and Canada have co-organized co this event. And before I hand over the floor to our speakers, I'd like to give the floor to Ambassador Moller. Over to you. Well, thank you, Leslie. Good afternoon to everyone. This is Vienna calling. I warmly welcome High Commissioner Bachelet, the Special Rapporteurs David Kay and Agnes Kalamar, Barbara Trionfi, Christophe Delors, and Fatou Janje Senor, and thank them very much for joining this event. And of course, welcome to all of you, wherever you may be sitting now. I hope you will find it interesting. I would encourage you to participate with your questions. This meeting was originally planned by our mission as a side event during the 44th session of the Human Rights Council, linked to the resolution on the safety of journalists, which Austria, together with a core group, traditionally runs every second year in September. Very much like with all plans we have made throughout this year, COVID-19 forced us to improvise and adapt now. But it also turned us into some kind of webinar experts now. I believe, or I, I at least hope, that the current crisis is also an opportunity to rethink political priorities. And I think that one lesson learned is that access to information and free, plural, and diverse media are indispensable for efficient and sustainable crisis management. In his last resolution on the safety of journalists, 
the Human Rights Council already recognized the importance of freedom of expression and of free, independent, plural and diverse media for democracies and informed citizenry, the rule of law and exposing corruption. It also urged political leaders to refrain from denigrating, intimidating or threatening the media and thereby undermining trust in the credibility of journalists. I think that it is more relevant than ever and it needs to be reaffirmed by governments in the light of COVID-19 as well. The Austrian government, for example, is currently working on a new law on the right to access to information. This has been in the pipeline for a long time, was agreed in the program of our current conservative Green government and should now be finalized before the end of this year. While we cannot yet be, unfortunately, entirely sure how the Human Rights Council will, will resume its work, I hope that today's discussion will help all of us to identify some of the points that the Human Rights Council should address. And as a last remark, I'm very proud to be able to co-organize this event with uh, the Netherlands and Canada. Thank you very much. And now back to Leslie, and I will immediately mute myself. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Robert, and I hope I have been unmuted. Um, so uh, just a few words from, from me here. Uh, the right to receive and impart information through any media and regardless of frontiers is one of the central components of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Access to information is a critical tool to prevent and combat corruption and ensure democratic participation as it enables the public to, amongst other things, impart decision making and influence legislation. It is central to, work, to the work of journalists and other media workers, civil society, and human rights defenders. However, certain persons and groups, including women and marginalized groups, face greater challenges, including threats, harassment, and violence than others in accessing information and exercising, excuse me, I... Sorry about that, I'm having a, a technical challenge. Um, and I was just saying that others in accessing information and exercising their freedom of opinion and expression. Even more concerning is when these actions are committed with impunity by governments and other actors. In Canada's view, these constitute serious violations and abuses of human rights. Freedom of opinion and expression, including access to information, is of the highest priority for the government of Canada. This is why, along with Brazil, Fiji, Namibia, the Netherlands, and Sweden, we'll be leading on a resolution on freedom of opinion and expression with a focus on access to information. States must fulfill their human rights obligations in this regard and ensure respect for freedom of opinion and expression. Canada also looks forward to hosting the next Global Conference for Media Freedom, which will bring together a broad group of stakeholders seeking to strengthen international efforts to protect the ability of journalists and media organizations to carry out their vital work. Access to information is critical to all media, and the discussion today will contribute enormously to the upcoming resolution and Global Conference for Media Freedom. Now, with no further ado, I'd like to invite Madame High Commissioner to take the floor. Over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Norton, and also hello to Ambassador Miller. Um, excellencies, friends, I'm really pleased to address this webinar on access to information and the safety of journalists in times of crisis. First of all, I hope you and your loved ones uh, are well during this difficult time. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to challenge our societies, our governments and ourselves, uh, disrupting the lives of billions of people on the planet. Uh, we are now at a difficult period with some countries reopening after lockdowns, another with infection and death rates still soaring. Subsequent waves of COVID-19 are likely to occur in different places at different times and with different degrees of severity. Indeed, while the virus itself does not discriminate, its uneven impact have laid bare the social and economic inequalities on which it feeds. The overall impact on lives and economies is clearly catastrophic, with the poorest and most marginalized those people suffering the biggest human rights deficits being affected worst of all. It is essential that the response efforts reach all, as well as the information about them. In fact, the pandemic has also laid bare the fundamental importance of freedom of expression and of free, independent, and plural journalism in times of crisis. Access to accurate and reliable information provides the population with the necessary resources 
to understand, participate and follow the guidelines of health authorities fosters truth, trust in the public institution and increases transparency and accountability. We must not forget freedom of expression like other human rights is a crucial component of public health. Participation builds greater trust in the authorities and better compliance with measures to restrict contagion. It is clear that access to information and a free, uncensored and unhindered media equips a democratic society to effectively respond to crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. It is people's right to count on accurate information about the pandemic. However, we have often witnessed attacks on the vital role of journalists and media workers, including through the withdrawal of media licenses, censorship, penalization of information, expulsion or internet shutdown. Dear friends, sadly, throughout the world, we are seeing journalists being harassed, others arbitrarily detained, and disproportionate measures restricting their capacity to carry out their vital work. As of two, uh, 2nd of June, the International Press Institute counted 233 free uh, media freedom violations around the world. Those include verbal and physical attacks, and 86 journalists arrested or charged for reports critical of state responses to the pandemic or for simply questioning the accuracy of official numbers of cases and deaths related to COVID-19. The actual number of media violations and arrests is probably far higher. We're also seeing vaguely formulated legislation to combat alleged misinformation or fake news being employed, about, uh, employed about, about against journalists. These measures at times allegedly taken to address a crisis can constitute an attack on media freedom and on people's right to information. Also worrisome are cases of journalists covering issues of public concern, such as the health crisis and government responses to COVID-19, as well as the social and economic impact of the pandemic being denigrated and intimidated by political leaders and their supporters. This discourse increases the risk of violence against journalists, undermines public trust, and may lead to self-censorship. Social media is adding fuel to the fire. Women journalists and media workers in particular face sexual and gender-based uh, threats, intimidation and harassment, both online and offline. Free and independent journalism should be supported everywhere to ensure the production of verified information, serving the public interest and holding the authorities and other actors accountable. Criticism is not a crime. As I mentioned before, the work of journalists also help build public confidence in public policies, including for measures taken to contain COVID-19 and address socioeconomic effects. And it's also thanks to journalists that we are able to see the human faces of the pandemic and the recovery. To continue to be able to do their vital work, news media institutions should have access to financial assistance programs offered by governments in response to the pandemic. And I welcome measures taken by some states to grant financial support to television channels with a national coverage with the view of guaranteeing this essential service in the current crisis. I equally welcome reports from various countries on the eligibility of freelance journalists for unemployment benefits and financial assistance. Dear friends, as we know, the COVID-19 crisis has also been accompanied by an infodemic of misinformation that harms the health response. It also fuels hate speech directed at various groups, including migrants, minorities, and LGBTI people. Journalists and the media have an important oversight role. Investigative journalists, news media, and fact-checking organizations are working to address false information and to keep the public informed with facts and official guidance issued by authorities. In the face of the challenges posed by COVID-19, for instance, the role of the media and journalists is vital. Access to accurate information is not only a right, it saves lives. So I call upon the Human Rights Council, the international community, and all of you to work with my office defending the right to access of information, supporting and strengthening the media, and ending impunity for attacks against journalists. This is essential for us to build back better as we recover from the pandemic. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Okay, I think you can hear me now. There seems to be a delay in the mute button, and I apologize that, but let me thank you, uh, Madam High Commissioner. Um, I think you have set the scene. Uh, you've highlighted uh, very much how the COVID crisis, which is really a multidimensional crisis, 
has laid bare uh, so many inequalities, uh, let alone uh, the socioeconomic impact on so many uh, already uh, vulnerable people. Uh, and uh, the, the line that you said that freedom of expression is crucial to public health really resonates very loudly for many. So I'd now like to turn to Claire LaRue from MUN or Mon Lyon to ask a question from a youth perspective. Over to you. Hello. Um, so in Europe, about a quarter of young people ages 18 to 24 consider social media their main source of news. And if anything, the COVID-19 crisis has shown us the scope and limitations of social media as a platform for free access to information. So on the one hand, in places where traditional media is highly controlled, it has been a way for citizens to access crucial, reliable information. And then on the other hand, as was mentioned, the spread of misinformation and disinformation has prompted a range of responses with varying results, raising many controversial questions. So in the context of these developments, I'd like to ask what criteria do you think should be used to determine what information to censor or warn against or conversely to promote on social media. Thanks very much, I apologize. So you are Jessie Gray and you're a member of Fairmoon. So thanks very much for that question and over to you, High Commissioner. Well, thank you. Well, we know, it's real true that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us uh, the, the real risk of the spread of misinformation and it makes sometimes difficult to identify accurate medical and public guidance and hampers uh, an effective public uh, health response and generates confusion and distrust among, among the, the population. So um, we, we, the United Nations recognizes that um, the world cannot contain the disease and it impacts without access to trusted, accurate information that promotes science and real solutions and builds solidarity within and between countries. And there is this Secretary General's Verify initiative that the UN is aiming to provide content that cuts through the noise to deliver life-saving information, fact-based advice, and stories from the best of humanity. And I strongly believe that in promoting the free flow of information and guaranteeing the fullest enjoyment possible to right to freedom of expression and of access to information, I do not believe that prohibitions on the dissemination of information such as misinformation, falsehoods for, um, or non-objective informations are the solution. These general and ambiguous terms do not actually, I would say, describe the content that is prohibited and there is a strong risk um, that such provisions provide a state with a broad remit to censor the expression of unpopular, controversial or minority opinions, as well as criticism of the government and politicians in the media. So approaches, approaches for combating this information should avoid criminalization and be instead evidence-based and tailored to proven uh, or documented impact of disinformation and propaganda. So these measures include the promotion of independent check-checking, fact-checking mechanism, the provision of support for independent and diverse uh, public service media outlets and public education campaigns. So our advocacy also aims to convince more and more tech companies to use the international human rights frameworks as their, as their guiding light when it comes to the business operation, including their content governance decision. Articles 19 and 20 of the ICCCPR and the UN Guiding Principles of Business and Human Rights should be central to their decision-making processes. We have already been seeing some progress and keep engaging with social media and other tech companies. In line with this, I think it's necessary to distinguish the different forms of inaccurate or misleading content. Likelihood of harm to health of, of, or life should be an important guiding element in making content moderation decisions. Flagging content as false or misleading. Downgraded it, I mean, decreased visibility. We believe that those information are really uh, harming health or the lives, or in more serious cases, taking it down. Mere inaccuracies or falsehoods as such should not be censored. But when leaders use social media to spread false information, the same consideration should be made. However, we should not forget that the public needs to have access to relevant information about their leaders. 
simply removing objectionable so statements may undermine such access and ultimately be in the way of accountability. So flagging such a statement, putting them into context, and adding accurate information may be the better way. And I think it's vitally important that the public has sufficient information to understand content moderation practices. Companies should therefore be as transparent as possible about content moderation decisions. And such decisions should also be subject to appeal. But most importantly, the focus should be on promoting a healthy discourse based on all information available. This includes the possibility to challenge conventional wisdom and require openness to debate. We all have seen that our understanding of COVID-19 has evolved over time and that advice given at some point may have become outdated only weeks later. So this is a part of the scientific process and we should avoid framing this as a misinformation issue. And I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Madam High Commissioner. Um, the thoroughness of your response was well appreciated. Um, and thank you very much for the question. Uh, so uh, before we go or move on to our next speaker, um, we're trying to get a sense of the temperature in our Zoom room. Uh, and so we'd like to hear from our audience. Uh, a, a poll should appear on your screen uh, with the following question, and I hope it's working. Um, do you feel that you did receive reliable, accurate, and timely information on the public health situation during the last months? You can answer fully, more or less, or no. I think we've, we've ended it there. Okay, and we're going to share the results now. We're saying 28% are saying fully, 58% are saying more or less, and no is 14%, which is a large percentage in the no zone. Well, that's something to think about, that's for sure. Um, okay, so now we're going to shift over to David Kay, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom and, and Opinion and Expression. Um, so David, you were very quick in your reaction and issued an extremely valuable report on freedom of expression and disease pandemics already in April. So can you tell us how you think governments have handled the situation so far and where we stand today on access to information and link there to democracy, good governance and good crisis management. So over to you and welcome. Great, thank you so much. And thanks to, uh, to the government of Canada, the government of the Netherlands uh, for, for sponsoring this webinar. Thanks especially to the high commissioner who has, I think, in a very, uh, very clear and comprehensive way, articulated many of the points uh, that I would have made as well. So, th so thanks very much, uh, Madam High Commissioner. I, I think that in order to answer the question, I think I would start by, by noting that the COVID crisis, the pandemic, has exposed, I think, in a very painful way, uh, the, the connection between freedom of expression and the public interest. I think that it has shown the absolute importance of robust freedom of expression, robu robust access to information, and a robust independent media that's protected and promoted by governments. And um, in my reporting, in, in the April report, uh, and in earlier reporting, I reported to the General Assembly in October on the issue of online hate speech, my reporting has always tried to, to focus, much as the High Commissioner highlighted, the connections between the robustness of the right under Article 19 to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media, um, and, and also to, to highlight the narrowness of the ability of states to restrict that right on, on the, the well-known three-part conditions. And I think that if we look at those, those rights and we look at the standards that apply to state restrictions, I would say by and large, the international community governments, although there's variation across the board, uh, are not performing well. And I would say that in a few different areas. One, we have seen censorship of health information. We've seen situations where doctors 
uh, where health workers, where the media has been unable to report not only on the nature of the crisis, but also on uh, the nature of government response. Uh, so that has been one, I think, real significant failure. We've also seen restrictions on journalists being able to do their jobs in the field. Oftentimes, this comes in the context of journalists who are not considered to be essential workers. Um, and at the end of the day, they're unable to be in the field and to do their work. And then, of course, we see issues around disinformation. And as the High Commissioner highlighted, disinformation, or as the WHO has put it, the infodemic, can be an extremely problematic aspect of dealing with public health. But at the same time, we've seen governments criminalize disinformation around the pandemic, which has, I think, fostered a, 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 an environment of self-censorship so individuals are less willing to share important information about what they're seeing in their communities and about what they are actually experiencing themselves. So, so I will end there. I think that the, the overall message uh, from my perspective is governments are not doing all that they should be in order to be promoting and protecting freedom of expression and access to information uh, in this very difficult crisis that we're all facing. Uh, so thanks very much for that, um, David. Um, so the report card is not good overall for governments. Um, but looking ahead, what role uh, does access to information play at times when almost all countries in the world are faced with economic recession and its social repercussions? I think that's an important question. And I think one of the things that we certainly do uh, acknowledge and something that we see is that the context of the pandemic has put pressures on governments. So those people who would be responsible, for example, for um, handling freedom of information requests, those people may not be in their offices in government. Now that's changing across Europe and in other places, but that, that fact is something that certainly governments can highlight as a, um, as a justification for a slower, perhaps, approach to, to responding to freedom of information requests. However, I think generally speaking, governments do have an obligation to continue to provide access to that information. And that means they need to be taking the extra steps to ensure with all the resources that they have, that people have access to the information uh, available to, to government, that they ensure that access through the internet is made, uh, is made fully available so that where there are shutdowns or slowdowns around the world, that those end immediately. I think there are different places where we can see that uh, access to information can, and restrictions on access to information cannot be justified merely because of resources, but instead through government uses of the crisis uh, in order to justify repressive measures that they would or have long wanted to take. And that's a, that's a very serious problem for democracy and for access to information during the pandemic. Well, okay, so thanks very much, um, David. Um, okay, so uh, if we just keep moving along, uh, because I think there's a lot of interest also from the audience to ask questions. So um, at, 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 at the end of all the presentations, I'm gonna turn to Agnès Calamar now, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary ex Executions. And so Agnès, you have worked extensively on threats to journalists who tried to hold authorities accountable. Um, what institutional framework on a national, regional, and international level is needed to fight impunity and enhance safety. How to ensure independent investigations into attacks on journalists and accountability. Over to you. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to, um, to speak. Uh, before going into the possible solutions, I just wanted to make uh, an additional point to those made by uh, David and the High Commissioner. Over the last uh, few days, week, we have been bombarded with um, images of uh, profound um, uh, disruption in our societies and the, um, the protest 
throughout the United States in particular, but also uh, in other places against the uh, systemic and systematized racism uh, within uh, our institutions and within our societies. I would like to link that somehow to COVID-19 because I think COVID-19 has acted as a very, um, as, as put a very sharp um, and, and um, enlarged, amplified zoom on the profound dysfunctioning of our societies. It has put a, a, a spot on um, the structural and systemic issues that we as a society have been unable to confront and key of them are inequality, inequity grounded on uh, systemic biases and racism. That is now, I think, unleashed in the public space through these, um, through these protests, which have also uh, have had a strong uh, press freedom component. As we know, journalists have also been targeted in the context uh, of those protests, uh, either because uh, of non-discriminatory use of, uh, of weapons by, uh, by uh, the police or directly targeted by, by the police. And to this, uh, we need to add the stigmatization of, um, of the, 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 the press, of the journalist, um, their stigmatization as truth teller, as fact finders. And um, I would like to um, uh, highlight one point that has been made by the High Commissioner and by David. We are living in a, in a time where facts are being under great attack and great duress. And we need to find our uh, epistemic authorities, those that are gonna give meaning uh, to facts and those that are going to give truth uh, to fight facts against the um, the attacks coming, including from political leaders. So I th I see the the normative attacks, the attacks against truth, the attacks against fact as uh, being amplified by uh, COVID nineteen and um, requesting on our part that we stand firm on the, um, the importance of, of this authority, of this epistemic authority that is ingrained in uh, the notion of fact-finding, the notion of uh, professional journalism. Um, and, you know, and I'm not uh, suggesting here that only those with a degree in journalism are professional journalists. I'm saying here there is a greater value that we must place on fact, fact-findings, truth-telling and voices, some of which we are now seeing being articulated in the streets, but many of which are being silenced. And COVID-19 has amplified all of those things. Um, so uh, now to, to answer directly to, to your question and, and uh, very, uh, very quickly, I have already spoken at great length after my investigation into the killing of Jamal Khashoggi um, in terms of what needed to be done. I believe strongly that um, a symbolic investigation can carry the message uh, very far. I believe that um, one um, strong investigation delivering accountability can do a great deal to protect journalists around the world. I think what's happening right now in Malta with um, the trial of those implicated in the killing of Daphne Caruana should stand as a model of what eventually we should see everywhere. We need to see regional organizations, international organizations using all the tools at their disposal to put pressure on governments so that um, the investigation independent, authoritarian, uh, effective can be carried out. As the case of Daphne has proven, a killing of a journalist is when you, when you investigate the killing of, of a journalist, what you are exposing is the maze of corruption within our society. What you are exposing is political corruption. What you are exposing is a poison that eat at our governance system, both locally, nationally, and internationally. This is why it is so important 
to support uh, families and civil society when they are calling for civil um, for uh, independent uh, investigation. I think there is a role for the UN there. I've said it before. Uh, special procedures can do and should do more. We would have done more, David and I, uh, had it not been for COVID-19. We were planning to do something um, by establishing formally a task force toward the investigation and toward supporting investigation in places where there is some willingness to do to do so i think we need to continue uh, and as soon as the opportunity comes we really need to uh, to be on uh, on the ground and to support um, family civil society and government officials who are prepared to stand for independent investigation into the killing of journalists um, i also I uh, believe that uh, in order to avoid the politicization that I have confronted when undertaking the investigation into the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, we should have an independent mechanism uh, along the lines of the IIIM that has been established for uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and so on. I believe that we should have an independent investigatory mechanism prepared to either undertake independent investigation into the killings of journalists or support national authorities through uh, technical assistance or by collecting or, or providing uh, legal assistance. Um, emblematic investigation, delivering accountability, supported by strong political messages on the part of the international community, on the part of ambassadors, on the part of um, head of state. That, to me, is what is going to bring um, not an end to the violence against journalists and probably not an end to uh, impunity, but it will certainly eat at, at it. It will eat at the mechanisms that allow for that violence to take place. It will demonstrate that no one can get away with uh, killing a journalist. And uh, while they may not face a court um, immediately, they certainly should face uh, our strong reactions. They should face the reactions of public opinion and they should face diplomatic and political uh, reaction. Thank you. Merci, Agnès. Uh, so this brings me to the second question. Uh, oh, I saw. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I answered all of your questions already. Actually, I think you probably did. I think you did. You, the, the second question was the specific risks do you see for the safety of journalists in these times of multiple crises, including with regard to the recent protests and targeting of journalists. Do you have anything else you want to add? I, I think, no, I mean, I, you know, I think I've said it. It's uh, the, the, the fact that journalists who are covering those protests, who are playing a um, a public interest role who are providing a voice to all parts of, um, of the, of the uh, society that are involved. Those journalists should not be targeted. They should not be targeted by the police. They should not be targeted by politicians and they should not be targeted by some of the uh, sections of society. And when this happens, we must be prepared to investigate. I have seen uh, dozens of cases on social media appearing to show uh, the targeting of journalists by uh, either um, some uh, masked individuals or by um, uh, the police uh, in the United States. That to me is unacceptable um, and I'm hoping and calling for all of those acts of violence, whether they were targeting targeted violence or violence violence as a result of the non-discriminatory use of non-lethal weapons, those cases must be effectively properly investigated. And if the authorities are not prepared to do it, we should be prepared to do it. We special rapporteur, we civil society need to pick on those cases, investigate them, demonstrate the mechanics that led to those journalists being targeted and ask for accountability. Oh, thanks very much, and yes, and uh, it's quite interesting because I could feel your passion coming through the Zoom call, and I have to say that I haven't felt um, I haven't felt that on a lot of Zoom calls. So um, indeed, the passion is coming through. So um, let me now turn to to Fatou Senghor, who's the West Africa Director at Article 19, uh, and Article 19 has recently published a briefing on ensuring the public's right to know during a pandemic. 
The paper touches upon how emergency legislation affects access to information laws, but also on the importance of open justice systems and the protection of whistleblowers in crises situations. So Fatou, do you think that this crisis can help us build back better and raise awareness about the importance of access to information? What, what would you think governance need to do, especially when it comes to legislation? So over to you and welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to really reiterate uh, the thanks for the organizers. Uh, I think this uh, webinar is very timely. Uh, the, uh, before probably I respond to, to, your, to your question, I would like to uh, state that uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed more than ever before uh, the interdependency of our world, of course, but also the centrality of access to information. And if we are able really to use effectively access to information, it will help our world really to understand the crisis, to work better, and to find effective uh, human and sustainable solution to this pandemic. This is important today because this pandemic has many facets. Uh, the impact is really unknown. And we are in a situation where most countries initially have been working in a silo and we realize that working together and being open can help the whole world to overcome the challenges of this pandemic. Uh, the other point that I want to also raise uh, is linked to what uh, the previous speaker mentioned, uh, particularly David Kay, about the public trust. We've seen across the continent uh, when the outbreak uh, of this pandemic at the beginning, there was a lot of uh, support to public policies. Uh, people rallied, civil society, opposition, many actors rallied around uh, executive to really uh, support the policies, especially the emergency measures to ensure that uh, the countries work together to, uh, to, to overcome the challenge. But as time goes, we've realized that there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, challenges, a uh, lot of lack of information, in relation to the public policies, lack of information in relation to the response from, from, from the, the government in uh, taking care of the most vulnerable in, in our society. And that has really triggered a lot of rejection. For the past few weeks, we've seen across the region a protest, uh, especially from vulnerable communities, rejecting those emergency measures, asking that uh, they are lifted. Because I think the basic needs of people uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the, the restrictions of their rights uh, has not been measured properly and a uh, solution provided to ensure that those measures that are restricting their right to movement, their right to work, their right to assembly would be mitigated by other uh, possibilities for them to be staying at home. And we've, we've seen uh, also loss of lives of many ordinary citizens who are just going up, uh, you know, after their businesses because they are vulnerable. They needed to go by, uh, to go around uh, to 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 find, uh, you know, adequate living to ensure that they are able to. And those have not been taken care of. And this is very important, I think, at this stage also to mention that uh, in order for some of those measures uh, to be to be effective, we need the public trust. And public trust will only come when those decisions are just, are fair, and are transparent, and, uh, I, and take into account the, the needs of the most vulnerable in our society. And they are consistently also applied across the board. Because once we've seen in many places, there have been a lot of discrimination in the application of some of those measures. Those who are powerful can sometimes get some, uh, some waivers to go around their businesses. And I think those also has created a lot of uh, distrust from, from the public. And what we've deplored also is the fact that people have lost their lives during these very distressful situations where the governments uh, were supposed to be further supporting people, uh, accompanying them, ensuring that uh, uh, they overcome these difficulties and, uh, and, 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 and and, and, and manage to, 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 to overcome the, the challenges. So in terms of uh, now what you mentioned earlier about uh, uh, is it an opportunity, I believe that we have a formidable opportunity to, to, be, to build a new beginning, a new narrative for access to information. We've seen countries that have solid and effective system of access to information, but they couldn't 
even uh, uh, sustain uh, the, the, the needs of citizens to provide information in this very difficult time. And this is a time, I think, uh, to reevaluate those systems, to, to, to look into where the gaps are, because it's very important to have a good legislation mechanisms in place, but when you have a crisis and you are not able to respond adequately to the citizens' need uh, in regards to their information and reliable information for that matter, I think the system needs to be reassessed. Uh, the other bit also, which is very important at this stage, I think we need also to build a consensus around the values and importance of access to information for the other countries that have not been able to agree to setting up uh, access to information regime, because I think this pandemic has shown to the whole world that information is indeed power. Information will help people to be more resilient, will help people to overcome, and also to protect themselves. And I think the, 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 the key uh, to, to this is to be able for, for citizens to have access to information for themselves so that they can, they can, they can play a vital role in protecting themselves, their families, uh, people around them, but also support government, uh, government policies. It's very critical, especially in most of the countries, especially in Africa, when government policies don't have buy-in, they, are, they, are, they, 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 they generally fail because you need the citizens to support you. You need in this time of distress, you need citizens that are uh, you know, supportive and not citizens that are fighting, that are already in the, always in the street contesting your decision because you, then you have a, a, a more a difficult situation to address because you have a pandemic, you, you are talking about social distancing and the, the, your citizens are in the street fighting those same decisions that are, that are meant to, to, to be protecting them. So we believe that those decisions must be known to the citizens, must be fair and, and also must be uh, given in a, in a way that also all communities, especially those in the rural, in, uh, in the disadvantaged areas, uh, also be able to, to get the information in a timely, but also in platform that is also uh, relevant to them to, to be able to, 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 to understand what, what, what those measures are, their implications, their scope, and also the impact in their ordinary life. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, I believe this is a time to build again the, uh, on the foundation that have already been there from the normative framework to the, to the different interpretations of those norms across the world. I think the time is right to further build uh, uh, on the values of access to information and to ensure that most countries and, and all countries and uh, citizens understand that access to information is indeed vital to fighting uh, uh, the pandemic, but also to maintaining peace and sustainable development. Uh, we've seen uh, an increasing number of uh, statements from regional bodies. Uh, I, I believe this is uh, very unprecedented on the continent to see the reaction from uh, human rights bodies. I've never seen this kind of reaction uh, and proactivity uh, uh, from their part. They have been very present in terms of uh, uh, recommending uh, states uh, the measures that should be taken in terms of reiterating the importance of uh, access to information. And I think the, 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 the briefing that you mentioned earlier is really consolidating and reiterating the importance of access to information that has been already uh, uh, developed and, 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 and sustained uh, in, in many of the international, uh, international uh, uh, instruments and reiterated by the recommendation of the different special rapporteur. So, so I believe that this is very important and timely. Uh, so building public trust, yes, information must be accurate and reliable. And to echo what uh, the previous speaker had mentioned, is also the journalists are critical in this uh, scenario. If also information must flow, those that are the vehicle of information must be protected, must be supported either financially, psychologically, and also ensure that they can continue to do their work and cover the, info, the, the news and other information that is of public interest. Thank you. So thanks very much, uh, Fatou. Um, an earlier speaker uh, quoted WHO uh, calling this an infodemic, but I think I, I think people would uh, agree that it's also a trust demic that uh, that the, the world is going through right now. Uh, and you mentioned um, 
in the building back better perhaps um, it's good to see the crisis also as an opportunity to, to really to build on the foundations that exist um, I don't know who said but don't let a good crisis go to waste um, so now um, we will turn to Christophe Deloire uh, who is the Secretary General and Executive Director of Reporters Without Borders um, so Christophe you work intensively on the issue of disinformation with the Information and Democracy Commission and the Journalism Trust Initiative. Um, and as mentioned, trust is a, is a key in effective crisis management. Uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, we've seen increased denigration of journalists by authorities if the reporting was questioning governmental decisions in addressing the pandemic. So this is worrisome in so many aspects. So I have two questions and I'll ask the first one now and let you respond and come back with the second one. What, what do you think has to be done to ensure journalists' safety in this environment. Over to you and welcome. Uh, thank you for mentioning the Initiative on Information and Democracy and, and the Journalism Trust Initiative. Both of them are structural solutions to uh, the information disorder, to the information chaos. And, and we have to look for uh, structural solutions. And I would like to thank uh, the governments of um, Austria, Canada, and Netherlands for organizing this um, meeting. I think we have, to answer your question, we have two types of actions in, in front of us, two, two key strategies. First, exercise pressure. Second, define better and stronger rules. Regarding the pressure that, that has to be exercised, I would like to congratulate and, and thank um, the High Commissioner, Michelle Bachelet, for what she said yesterday about um, the a very bad evolution in some uh, Asian countries. Such statements are absolutely um, crucial. And, and uh, David Kay and Agnès Calamar uh, are, are doing um, things that are also extremely important. And of course, civil society can also contribute to exercise pressure. But we are in a period where we are we have to mobilize, and that's what we are doing is through the organization of such a meeting, but where we have um, to mobilize democratic governance, um, to raise the cost, the cost for all those who violate uh, press freedom, to impose a, a logic of coalition uh, instead of a logic of competition. And that's what the, the government of Canada initiated with the Media Freedom Coalition. It's um, absolutely great. Um, now uh, there will be test cases. What will be the impact on China? And I think that the Media Freedom Coalition um, will, should consider China um, as a test case about uh, how the coalition can work and ca what types of results um, can expect, including, of course, what happens uh, regarding the new law uh, in, in Hong Kong. Same for Saudi Arabia. Will the Media Freedom Coalition succeed to get results before the G20 summit in Riyadh? Um, these are uh, very concrete questions. Then um, I, of course, agree with Agnès Calamar regarding the creation of an independent mechanism for the implementation of international law. Uh, you may know that since uh, 2015, when the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2222 was adopted uh, in New York, uh, we um, constantly say that uh, there are a lot of UN resolutions, but there is a lack of a concrete implementation mechanism. We consider that a special representative should be to the UN Secretary General should be appointed. Uh, it can be a, a mechanism uh, like the one that Agnès suggests. That, but in any case, I think uh, it's time now to, to, to build on such proposals to really uh, develop the implementation of the international law. I'm now switching to the digital challenges. Press freedom predators sometimes kill journalists. Platforms and social networks could kill journalism itself. And those platforms and social networks, they have taken a lot of initiatives, sometimes uh, positive initiatives during the uh, infodemic, but those um, solutions uh, about fact checking, etc are almost nothing as compared with the challenges, unfortunately. And um, we have uh, to move forward 
um, toward uh, really a regulation uh, of platforms on those issues. And I will uh, finish my intervention through uh, some comments about the concept of access to information, because the question of concepts, I think, is very important now. Are they appropriate? Are they, adapt are they adapted to the change of paradigm? And what is exactly access to information? I, I perfectly understand that you um, consider it's access to accurate and reliable information. But may I say that the concept, to my opinion, is a bit weak um, because it can also be access to rumors. If you, are, if you have access to, to reliable information, also access to rumors, and also access to manipulative content, and if those manipulative contents, those rumors are amplified through the system of, of platforms and social networks, uh, in fact, uh, this access um, is a bit weak. Um, and in front of us, we have despotic regimes uh, which have strong concepts. So uh, we should move forward uh, towards something that is closer to the right to know, to the right of, to reliable information. And, and you have a reference to build on, which is a declaration on information democracy. Uh, which clarifies the principles of the global information and communication space. I would like to thank again your three countries for uh, being part of the 36 countries which signed uh, the um, official partnership on information democracy signed on the margins of the um, last uh, UN General Assembly. And we have created a forum on information democracy um, to really develop the principles that are adapted to the current um, challenges and, and I call on governments to, to work with us uh, uh, to help us to develop this because uh, through the activity of the Forum on Information Democracy, we will facilitate civil society work around the world with research centers, NGOs, etc., to really give uh, legitimacy and, and input for the, the regulation and, and the management of, of, of those uh, crucial issues. So I think we, we are currently inventing a new way to collaborate between governments and uh, NGOs, and that's very positive. Okay, so thank you very much, Christophe. And I did have a second question for you, which I'm going to read out, but I'm gonna let you at the very end in your during your two minute response period for uh, to respond to the audience, let you maybe roll in. Um, your answer to this question. And it's about frequently seeing journalists covering um, protests and being attacked from security forces, but also from protesters themselves who have lost trust in the media. And how can we get out of this, this spiral that we're in? So if you can think about that and come back at the very end when you have two minutes to, to, to wrap up and respond to the audience questions. Okay, so thanks very much for your comments, Christophe. And, and finally, I'd like to uh, welcome our last speaker, Barbara Trionfi, who is the Executive Director of the International uh, Press Institute. And thank you so much for your patience. Um, so two questions for you as well. And uh, perhaps I'll ask them both at once and, and just let you answer um, to both of them. And then we will at that point um, turn, um, I think, to, uh, to uh, the questions from the audience. So the two questions for you, for the most patient person in the room, is how did the COVID-19 crisis touch upon the different kinds of safety necessary for journals to do their job and ensure access to information for the public, physical, legal, and economic safety we're talking about here. And then the second uh, question for you is what do government, governments need to do to ensure a plural media landscape and thus access to information in times of economic recession? Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you, Ambassador Monorton, and thanks to the organizer of this important um, uh, conversation. Um, on, um, on the safety of journalists and, and um, access to information in general, IPI has been uh, monitoring attacks against journalists and restrictions on press freedom and media freedom since the very beginning of this crisis. Uh, since the very um, start, it became clear to IPI that governments were going to take advantage of the health crisis to restrict journalists' ability to disseminate information on issues of public interest and, and, and seek to control the message. And indeed, we have seen this happening from different types of governments, from more or less democratic ones, across really across the world. Um, the, the, 
you know, and, and this is in spite, as, as previous speakers have said, in spite of the fact that, especially at the time when governments restrict other rights in order to limit the spread of the pandemic, this is when journalism should be allowed to scrutinize the actions of the government and make sure that they are indeed in the interest of the people. Um, IPI has kept um, record of the various violations that we have um, been monitoring in, um, in, a, in a tracking system, and I'll post the link um, in the chat. Um, and what we have seen so far since uh, mid-February, when the crisis started, we have recorded 335 different type of violations. Um, and, and this is probably a, a little amount of what is really out there. What we have seen are arrests and detentions of journalists. Um, many of those uh, took place, uh, like many journalists were detained for um, violating lockdown restrictions as a consequence of the fact that governments failed to give special permits to journalists to cover the crisis. So there, no press passes were issued and, and journalists could not go out and cover what was going on. Um, and, and on the other hand, um, uh, journalists have also had, many speakers have, as, as mentioned, journalists have trouble accessing information from the government with freedom of information laws being suspended, but also uh, difficulties on accessing press conferences by the government. Very often, um, the government took, governments took the opportunity of the crisis to limit the number of journalists who can participate in person to press conferences in a selective way that would favor their um, interests. Um, also, as it was mentioned before, we have seen an, uh, a boom of new anti-fake news laws. Indeed, as many speakers have highlighted, disinformation is a concern, but we have also seen that empowering governments to pass criminalize, to pass criminal laws to stop this information is not the way ahead. Just since February, we have monitored 16 new countries that have passed new anti-fake laws, laws and others that have abused such laws to limit information that is really in the public uh, interest. Typically, these laws have been used to silent critical journalists, to silent journalists that were questioning the, the data, the numbers disseminated by government sources, and to silence in general critical voices. Um, and and uh, we have even seen physical attacks, physical attacks against journalists that criticize the, the government uh, line. Um, as Fatou mentioned, indeed, there has been a movement towards supporting the actions of the government in protecting us from the health crisis. And yet, this very often has also become, you know, a, a public manifestation of hate towards uh, those journalists that questioned the, the fact that the, the, gov the, the actions of governments were indeed in the public interest. Um, Additionally to all this, what we see is the economic crisis affecting the media. The economic crisis that, is, that we, are, we are witnessing as a consequence of the epidemics is affecting those news organizations that have struggled to survive in repressive environments. We see countries like Hungary, where a small a fraction of the media industry was still able to operate independently, in spite of the numerous government restrictions, these are about to die because of the economic hardship. Um, and, 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 and this is the, these are the long-term consequences of this crisis that we are going to see on the media environment. Let me go to your second question. What can governments do? First of all, the restrictions that have been passed since the beginning of the crisis had no sunset clause, had no basically clause that said these restrictions will end when the health crisis will be over uh, or these restrictions will end at the end of the year whenever it is deemed appropriate. So our concern is that many of these restrictions that have been sneaked in silently at the moment when people were distracted, at even the moment when the international community was distracted because they were focusing on the, on the health crisis, that these restrictions will remain with us, together with the surveillance that this crisis um, will bring along and the economic um, hardship that will affect 
the news media even more. So our call on the governments is to really push for these restrictions to be revoked. We need to go back to the, 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 the journalists need to be able to exercise the rights at least as much as they could before the crisis, if not more. And I say if not more, it because the crisis has shown everybody the importance of accurate and credible information, not only coming from the countries where we live in, but also coming from across the world. The fact that we could not get accurate data from uh, countries like China, Iran maybe at the beginning of the crisis has affected our ability to react to the crisis properly. So the, the value of accurate, pluralistic information for society has been highlighted very clearly by this crisis. And this should be, become an opportunity for government to stress the importance of journalism. And thirdly, how can government, other than by, um, by ensuring that press freedom is respected in their own countries and, in, 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 and elsewhere, and how can they support a pluralistic media environment? In a time of economic crisis, there, there is the need to make public funds available towards this. Public funds in the form of direct support of media, but also in the form of public interest ads. And, and, and we need to reform a system which exists in many countries through which public funds is being redirected to the media and ensure that this system really goes to fund those media that disseminate information of public interest, those media that um, give also voice to uh, minorities, that give voice to, uh, to, to, to different sectors of society. Uh, we, we need to find um, um, models for dissemination of public funds to a plurality of news organizations and not just to those that have the biggest market share. So, um, I'll leave it there for the moment, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Barbara. Very appreciate it. Uh, and so from what I understand and from what I can see on the chat, we've had a very lively uh, web chat uh, today as well. Uh, and as during previous write-on sessions, um, we've received numerous comments on the interventions of our panelists. Uh, and there's several questions for each speakers from what I understand. So they've been selected. And so um, I'm going to ask Natasha if you're able to read out the, the, the selected questions to each speaker. Uh, and then once, once they're all read out, I'm going to turn um, to uh, each speaker and you will have two minutes uh, to respond. And I would really ask you to try and respect that because we don't want to get kicked out of our Zoom room space. So, Natasha, are you able to read them out? Yes, Ambassador, uh, thank you for the floor. Uh, as you already mentioned, we had a very uh, lively discussion in the, in the chat. Um, a lot of our participants are actually uh, more active on our YouTube channel, but uh, we have gathered the questions nonetheless. And I will, I will read them out together um, given that we are very tight on time uh, there was actually a lot of interest on the role of uh, governments so uh, the first question goes uh, some governments have responded to the pandemic by trying to control information including statistics on grounds that this is a war and not the time for criticism is this a reasonable argument the second question that comes uh, in relation to government is um, that governments are important stakeholders in IFIs and uh, um, what do they do to address reprisals against journalists and restrictions imposed criticizing projects that they contribute to. Uh, the third question um, in relation to governments uh, is that we are seeing um, governments that are censoring web pages and YouTube videos of groups promoting treatments that do not have any scientific basis such as the use of industrial bleach to treat COVID-19. Uh, these groups argue that this is a violation of their freedom of expression. And what would be the views of our panelists on this? Uh, our uh, fifth, a fourth question is that on journalists specifically, and we have seen that they have been harassed and detained in a number of countries during COVID-19 on charges of sharing misinformation and inciting panic. So uh, what can we do to make sure that these practices do not take hold in the new normal? Our uh, fifth question is, um, on uh, the universal right to, to access information, something analogous to the Council of Europe's convention, which is nearly about to come into force. Uh, 
And the last question uh, relates to the private sector, uh, where one participant asked if um, our panelists agree with the approach of companies like Twitter or Facebook to fake news and incitement. That would be all uh, from the text chat. So thanks very much for that. So David, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, and again, um, you can answer um, or comment on one or a few, but uh, you have two minutes. So over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Now, I want to be very brief and just maybe address um, one, and if I have time, two questions. And that was the, the very first question related to statistics. Um, I think that it's, um, it's absolutely essential, particularly at a time of pandemic, for public information, for statistics to be available to the public. Um, this is, in fact, not a question of criticism of government. It's a question of how do we crowdsource information so that scientists, so that the public, so that policymakers have the most information available to them in order to make informed choices about what's important for public health. It's a perfect example, the issue of statistics, a perfect example of how government restrictions on access to information actually harm public health and other rights. So I, I really cannot emphasize that enough. On the issue of social media and other internet platforms, um, of course, I think they're, they're playing a, an important role in, this, in the context of the pandemic because of their gatekeeping function related to access to information around the world. And I think that as we think about the role that, that the companies are playing, which as long as it's transparent and available for all of us to see and to evaluate, that, that that's, it's, it's fine for them to be doing that. I think the big question for us, and I'll, I'll close on this, is whether the aggressiveness that they're taking to public health information will translate into other areas where, uh, where there can be significant harms. For example, disinformation around voting rights uh, and other issues like that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this program today. Thank you very much, and thank you for respecting the time limitation. And yes, over to you for your two minutes. Thank you very much, and um, I'm uh, just going to uh, re-emphasize um, uh, David's point, uh, access to information in times of a pandemic, in times of a crisis is uh, fundamental. Governments may be tempted to think that by controlling information, they may control uh, people, they may control violence, uh, they may control the unrest, they may control the disease. Um, it's uh, it's uh, uh, an impression that is not uh, based on fact, it's not based on, uh, on evidence. Yes, some form of uh, balancing act uh, is authorized and uh, ought to be um, uh, undertaken in terms of uh, responding to uh, an emergency of this nature. But the uh, historical work that has been done, the empirical work that has been done, has demonstrated that um, uh, an, uh, a free access to information or the freest access to information and a free media are far greater uh, conditions uh, for um, the protection of societies, including against pandemic, than their control. Uh, that has been certainly very much proven with um, famine, for instance, where uh, there is no famine in places where there is uh, a free access to information and, and, uh, and the free media. It has been proven around access to information with regard to environmental um, hazards. Uh, it, the impact of censorship in the context of uh, Chernobyl, for instance, has been disastrous on and for people's health. So whatever the instinct of government is when it comes to the control of information, we must be um, insisting on the fact that uh, history and evidence are proving and have proven time and time again that a free access to information, um, a free media, 
are the greatest forms of protection we can have against the impact of uh, disaster uh, and pandemics. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Agnès. Fatou, over to you for your, your concluding uh, comments, your two minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just to reiterate uh, the importance of access to information, uh, the fact that also uh, this pandemic should not give carte blanche uh, to government to negate uh, the rights and also to waive their responsibility. It is very important uh, for the government to continue to honor their, right, their, their obligations uh, on transparency, on, account, on access to information, and to ensure that they are accountable to their citizenry. It is also critical that information gives citizens the possibilities to question government actions. Uh, tolerance and openness are critical. And if citizens are not part of the conversation, if citizens don't buy in, I think the mistrust will continue and they, there is a lot of inefficiency in terms of government action. The other point is equality and non-discrimination. It is very important we look into uh, that and look at vulnerable communities. Uh, access to information uh, should also enable us to really look at government programs, how they impact on vulnerable communities, especially women and people with uh, you know, low income and uh, other, other vulnerabilities to ensure that they address them for, if, with a view really to, to ensuring that any policies of government will be effective and, and accepted by the citizenry. Uh, there they, they, they is another point that I want to reiterate uh, the fact that government takes uh, measures in terms of emergency measures doesn't mean that all human rights are negated. They must meet the three-part test. In our different briefings, especially the one that is uh, on the table today, we also reiterated the importance of the three-part test. And I think the, the, the exception or the, the, the something that the government will be putting into consideration is to say we are limiting the right to freedom of expression to access to certain information because of uh, public health uh, imperative and that must also be uh, really really uh, narrowly narrowly defined so it's just important to say human rights and uh, the, the free press are, are paramount at this stage and the respecting freedom of expression and the press freedom and especially protecting journalists will be really, really critical in, in, in working together across the world to, to, to fight this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatou. Uh, Christophe, over to you for your two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I hope there is no misunderstanding when I spoke about um, what I consider as the weakness of the concept of uh, access to information. It's not to, to deny the legitimacy of the, con uh, of the concept, but to say that for sure, this is a prerequisite, but we have to go beyond this. And, and, um, because in the history of democracies, um, there were, um, of healthy democracies, there were ho always democratic safeguards in the field of information and, and uh, mechanisms to promote trustworthiness of news and information. And those mechanisms, uh, those safeguards, um, as have exploded with, with the digital space. And that's what we have to build again. So no misunderstanding on, on the question of uh, um, access to information. Um, Barbara spoke about fake news laws. F for sure, uh, um, they are often dangerous, but it is also true that this information is dangerous. So we have to solve this dilemma. And the solution is not to be focused too much on content regulation, but be focused more on market re, uh, regulation, how to promote trustworthiness of news and information positively instead of targeting disinformation. And that the question is how can we uh, reward all the media outlets that are really trusted third parties with a demanding conception of journalism. And that's exactly the purpose of uh, the Journalism Trust Initiative, which was launched uh, by Reporters Without Borders, uh, but in, in partnership with uh, now 120 entities, um, uh, and NGOs, media outlets around the world, uh, unions, um, to create a concrete mechanism so that algorithms, platforms and social networks, advertisers, 
regulatory bodies can give incentives to media outlets that comply with journalistic ideals without entering any discretionary um, logic. So create a mechanism, a, a principles-based mechanism, but with very concrete impacts, including an impact on media sustainability, because of course, there will not be any good journalism uh, um, without uh, media sustainability. Thank you very much, Christophe. And Barbara, over to you for the last uh, two minutes, the last word before I uh, have the pleasure of turning over the, the floor over to my, my colleague from the Netherlands. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, maybe just a couple of words, you know, how um, medical doctors have uh, pointed out that this pandemic is a test. It's a test on how prepared we are to face this type of health um, crisis. And, and certainly from IPI's point of view, we have seen these also as a, as a test uh, to see how resilient our systems of protection of um, media, um, media freedom and, and freedom of expression are. And it is that indeed uh, many governments, too many governments uh, throughout this crisis have been prepared to rush uh, new regulations you know, or new administrative decisions in order to limit the ability of um, journalists uh, to cover uh, the crisis uh, or certainly to um, criticize the governments uh, in, the, in their approach to the crisis. Uh, um, so th this is concerning, but this is also certainly for us an opportunity to learn. This is maybe one of many crises we'll see in the future. and. Uh, and learn how what you know, how 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 much we have failed, how much how problematic it has been to limit the access to quality information in a situation like this. I also find it interesting that in the moment we are confronted with um, disinformation campaign, there is a general call on uh, censorship rather than calling on quality information to be there. And, and especially at a time where, when, as I said, because of the restrictions and because of the economic crisis, we are seeing a, a weakness in the journalism that we have never seen before. So I think that in order to, um, in order to protect the rights of the journalists, but also in order to protect the availability of quality information in the future, we really need to focus very much on. Um, how to value journalism more in our societies, how to ensure that we don't have heads of states that constantly bash journalists, don't build a society that lacks trust in the journalistic uh, profession. And, and uh, so, so I think that look, looking ahead, we really need to dedicate much more resources into giving greater value to uh, journalism rather than calling for uh, greater censorship. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Barbara. And thank you to all of you for your very excellent and succinct interventions uh, and for mostly sticking to the two minute requirement. So thank you for that. So I now have the pleasure to hand over the floor to Ambassador Van Dalen for closing remarks. Monique, over to you. Thank you very much, Leslie. And also thank you very much, Robert. And a big thanks to all panelists for the excellent contributions. I've listened with uh, great interest to the remarks of the High Commissioner and I would like to commend Michelle Bachelet for her tireless efforts to ensure a human rights-based approach in the current crisis. I want to thank both Special Rapporteurs, David Kay and Agnes Kayama, for your excellent work in the field of freedom of expression and the safety of journalists and your willingness to speak out. David, you are ending your mandate in challenging times, but I'm sure your legacy, including the latest report on freedom of expression and disease pandemics, will continue to guide us in the future. Also, special thanks to Fatou Yanya Senghor, Barbara Triomphi, and Christophe Deloire. Your direct connections with the fields and the experiences you bring from around the world are crucial to have informed discussions and to guide our responses. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's event, we discussed two aspects regarding freedom of expression that are very closely linked to each other, access to information and the safety of journalists. The main takeaways for me, 
We emphasize that access to information and freedom of expression are of vital importance in times of crisis. And we explored the indispensable role of journalists and media workers in ensuring access to accurate and reliable information. We have discussed that they can only perform their role in a safe, enabling media environment and stress the very important role of governments in this regard. We also considered the often extreme risks associated with the work of journalists and media workers, even more so in times of crisis. More specifically, we looked at how the COVID-19 crisis is impacting the safety of journalists around the world. But these challenges are also opportunities to build back better, to make press freedom and the safety of journalists our absolute priority to ensure government transparency and to step up efforts to protect journalists and media workers, including by ensuring accountability for violence against journalists and media workers. The Netherlands remains committed to promoting a human rights-based approach to the current crisis and freedom of expression, both online and offline, including access to information, remain top priority for my country. I'm happy to mention again, as Leslie did in the beginning, the cross-regional group of countries, Canada, Sweden, Fiji, Brazil, Namibia, and the Netherlands, that intend to present a Human Rights Council resolution on access to information. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, the Right On initiative has again proven to be a great way to continue our human rights discussions providing a unique opportunity for interaction with people from all around the world. And I want to thank once again all panelists, as well as the co-organizers, sponsors, and all other participants in today's event. Thank you and have a great evening or rest of the day or good night, depending on your time zone. And thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.